We'll call the meeting to order, please. <clears throat> Pardon me. This is the Village of Riverside Board of Trustees regular meeting for Thursday, April 15th, 2021. The time is 7.02. Please call the roll. President Sells. Here. Trustee Collins. Here. Trustee Evans. Here. Trustee Galagos. Here. Trustee Hannon. Here. Trustee Gisa. Here. Trustee Pollock. Here. Village Attorney Molina. Here. Village Manager Francis. Here. Also present Village Clerk Haley. Thank you very much. Um, I see next up is a public comment. I see that we do have a number of folks joining us this evening. Real, uh, real quick before oh, I'm we sorry, start, Mr. President. Yeah, the, the, yeah, Just the code because we are, you. thank you. We are operating virtually still, but there is, we are still under a gubernatorial uh, public health order and President Sells has made a determination that it is impractical and uh, in, in order to meet live at this time. And so we do meet the criteria under the Open Meetings Act amendments done in June of 2020 uh, to hold this meeting virtually, and we are. Thank you, Mr. Molina. So if you're with us this evening and you would like to address the board, you're welcome to do so now during public comment. Or if there's a specific item that you would like to address, you, you, you can wait till we get to that agenda item and then uh, make your comment. I just ask, give me a wave like this, not, not the virtual wave, but actually give me a wave. I'll call upon you. And then if you could just uh, state your name and address and then make your comment. Um, is there anyone that would like to address the board at this time? Yes, ma'am, please. Hi there, my name is Natalie Bomke Swiderski and my husband and I and our baby just moved to 37 Long Common. And I just wanna thank the board for tabling the Labara Bocce Courts issue um, because my husband and I have a lot of concerns. Um, we just want more details, obviously. I feel like none have been released. So um, thank you so much for doing that um, and allowing neighbors uh, to give their input. We moved from the city of Chicago because in the cloak of darkness, uh, the city council voted on an ordinance that affected our property values. And so that's why we decided to move to Riverside. We love the family friendliness of the community. And um, again, thank you for that. You're very welcome. Yeah, that, that kind of got, uh, staff was just trying to accommodate, you know, one of our businesses, but that, that got in there before we had proper time to vet it completely. So we will make sure that everyone around uh, in that area has, has an opportunity to, to provide feedback because mm -hmm. we, you know, we very much, I mean, our, our residential areas are sacrosanct and we want to make sure that you are, you're able to enjoy your property and, and welcome to Riverside. It's nice to have a new neighbor. Thank you so much. We're so excited to be a part of the community. That's great. Uh, I saw a hand wave, I believe. Hi, yes, my name is Jamie Bozinski. I grew up at 41 Long Common and I was coming in to basically mirror exactly what Natalie said. My parents live next door. We're longtime Riverside residents and we do not want to, um, we wanna have an opportunity to address that Bachi Labara issue. Absolutely. Thank you for coming tonight. I appreciate it. Anyone else at this point? Seeing none, we'll move on then to reports of, of village officers. First up is the president's report, and I have two items. One is an Arbor Day proclamation that I will read. <clears throat> My voice will make it through it. Whereas in 1872, Jay Sterling Morton proposed to the Nebraska Board of Agriculture that a special day be set aside for the planting of trees. And whereas the holiday called Arbor Day was first observed with the planting of more than a million trees in Nebraska. And whereas Arbor Day is now observed throughout the nation and the world. And whereas trees can reduce erosion of topsoil by wind and water, purify the air and water by reducing pollution and create plant and wildlife diversity. <clears throat> And whereas trees have been shown to reduce crime, increase property values, reduce heating and cooling costs and conserve energy use. And whereas trees can beautify our parks and streets, improve the quality of our urban environment and carry on the tradition planned by the inventive vision of Frederick Law Olmsted. And whereas trees, wherever they are planted are a source of joy and spiritual renewal. Now, therefore be it resolved that I, Benjamin Sells, the village president, proclaim the day of April 30th, 2021 as Arbor Day in the village of Riverside, 
and I urge all citizens to plant and care for trees to gladden the heart and promote the protection and care of trees within our community and in woodlands. In witness hereof, I have set my hand and affixed the seal of the village of Riverside this 15th day of April, 2021. So that's part one of my report. <clears throat> part two is just a, an update on the Groveland uh, project, the flood mitigation project. The, uh, the Preservation Commission at their last meeting had an opportunity to, to review some of the drawings, renderings that we've received from Burke Engineering. And they had a number of suggestions, really excellent suggestions about ways that we might make the, uh, the appearance of the wall more uh, historically appropriate and more naturalistic. So with that in mind, staff is preparing a memorandum to summarize the recommendations of the uh, Preservation Commission. And that will be first circulated to the commission members and once they have signed off on it, we're going to arrange a meeting with representatives from the Preservation Commission with the landscape architect with Burke Engineering to go through and address their concerns. Uh, once we have a design that the Preservation Commission is happy with, we will then forward it on to Landscape Advisory Commission for any landscape suggestions they might have. And also during this process, if there are other community organizations or individuals who would like to take part in this conversation, <clears throat> pardon me, they're welcome to attend the open meetings of the Preservation Commission with regard to design and of course our meeting when we come to discuss it. So that's kind of where we are uh, with regard to the Groveland project at this point. Any questions about any of that? Okay, so we'll move on now to the approval of the consent agenda. Oh, I'm sorry, Manager Francis, it's your, your turn. Thank you, President Sells. I do have a couple of items this evening. I just wanted to um, remind businesses that there, there is still $1,700 remaining for our business grants through EDC. Um, if any businesses have questions about those grants, they can contact Director Johns for details. It is a 50-50 program. Um, it's one of our COVID-19 grant initiatives. Um, also, ComEd will be scheduling preventative maintenance vegetation management this spring. ComEd is to notify residents of any potential outages. They or, or if they are accessing a resident's property. Sometimes they will do hang tags, other times they will do um, calls and leave messages, um, but I just want residents to be aware of it and keep a lookout. Also, I wanted to congratulate Director Tab. Um, he had submitted a request to IRMA. They have an intern program that they do annually during the summertime. We, Basically, the Public Works Department will have the intern from July 19th through the July 22nd. Um, that intern will work on various training plans for Public Works and update some risk management policies for that department. And it is at no additional cost to the village. It's just an additional program that Irma offers to their members. And finally, I have a couple of updates on some IDOT work that will be occurring in the village. First, the, there will be bridge repair on 31st Street over to the, the Des Plaines River. Um, it's anticipated that this work will begin on May 3rd, um, mm -hmm. but I just want to caution residents that that date has moved a couple of different times, so there could be further updates on, village, on the Village website um, if it's pushed back again, but right now it's tentatively scheduled for May 3rd with an estimated completion date in July. And then Des Plaines, will be resurfaced and this is a project as well through IDOT and it will go from 31st Street to 26th Street. This is anticipated to start on Monday. Uh, the resurfacing project is estimated to be completed in July as well. That is all I have to report this evening. Thank you, Manager Francis. <clears throat> we'll move on now to the approval of the consent agenda. Uh, we are removing item E from the consent agenda and we will discuss that after we get through with the consent agenda. The remaining items on the consent agenda this evening are to approve the voucher list of bills for April 15, 2021, approve the Village Board of Trustees regular meeting minutes April 1, 2021, review and file the Riverside TV Commission meeting minutes of March 8, 2021, and the Finance, Fire, Police and Public Works March monthly reports. 
an ordinance approving continued, oh, that's the one we're skipping, an ordinance authorizing relief measures due to the COVID-19 pandemic, a waiver of certain 2021 liquor licensing fees, and lastly, an ordinance amending the village code of the village of Riverside, Illinois, relative to village staff restructuring and adopting an updated official pay plan. Are there any other items that anyone wanted to remove to discuss? Hearing not, I'd ask for a motion and second to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Motion by Mr. Gallego, second by? Second. By Collins, please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Gallegos. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Giza. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries. With regard to item E, which is an ordinance approving continued temporary use of village right of way and other public and private spaces for outdoor dining, and other authorized purposes and approving certain temporary signage for spring summer of 2021 extension. Um, I would first suggest that we remove section 2D, which is the item that refers to the uh, Bocce court idea with, with Labara. Uh, with, that, with that removed, are there any concerns with the remaining ordinance, Mr. Hannon. Are we removing also all references to the private closure area because that definition is used throughout? Mr. Molina, do you want to address that? You're muted, Lance. If it's only relevant to the to the bocce issue, it probably should be removed. Anything else? Okay, with those amendments then, I'd ask for a motion and a second to approve the ordinance. I'll make that motion. Motion by Mr. Gallegos. I'll second. Second, second by Ms. Evans. Uh, before I call the roll, let, let me just throw one more thing out, an opportunity. Um, actually, let's, let's, let's get the vote, then I'll, then I'll bring this up. Please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Gallegos. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Giza. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of more, more, more research and investigation that needs to be done about this idea about that Labara has, has uh, brought forward. Are there any particular items that anyone has as of this evening that they would, they would like staff to look into? Mr. Hannon? I have a fundamental question of, of, of how this issue made its way onto the consent agenda and you know, the description used in both the summary and the ordinance itself is much different than the picture that was circulated less than two hours before the meeting itself. Uh, there was no mention of a 20 by 30 tent. There's no mention of a food preparation area uh, very close to the five foot setback. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I like to think that we're wildly transparent. And when something like this comes by, um, you know, I, it, it makes me question what, what else may, you know, may have been missed in some of these brief descriptions. I, I just troubled like by that. And I'd, I'd like to hear some explanation. And I can address that first. I mean, I, I saw this at the same time um, you, you all did. It should never have been on the consent agenda to start with. Uh, it, it should never have been part of the ordinance to start with until we had done our proper investigation of it. We, we, I think that's what a lot of the trustees concluded, but how did it get there in the first place? Uh, Ms. Francis, do you want to address that? Certainly. Um, staff was tasked with reaching out to the businesses as we were last year related to COVID relief. Labara had presented this as a potential option. Um, they had done some very uh, rough drawings last year in which they had submitted that obviously needed work. Um, and so similar to what we had done last year, with different businesses looking at ways to facilitate additional seating and also help them and their businesses during these difficult times, 
that I, I myself worked with attorney Marsh <coughs> to incorporate this, viewing it under that certain, that same lens. And so that, that was my error in incorporating it in this, but I looked at it under that same lens of how can we bring relief to our businesses? So I viewed it similarly to some of the actions that we did for Labara and Saw Millie and Choo Choo last year. So that was my reasoning in incorporating this. Um, so it was by no means to mislead the board. Good and I'm happy if I can continue. And, I, and I'm very happy to hear that. And I think, I don't wanna speak for all the trustees, but we're all for providing as much support for those businesses as possible, you know, possibly expanding the street area if that's what they need. But, you know, my concern is you know, this, this is an area that was not been previously used, you know, it does butt up right against uh, homeowners. And, and these are, you know, rel most of those homes either in the process of turning over or turning over uh, in the past few months. And, um, you know, very concerned that that would be their first taste of Riverside of uh, something popped up, um, you know, without getting there input or at least giving them notice that this was being considered by the board. So, you know, I would hope that there would be, you know, a future sensitivity on, you know, sort of the, the, what I've experienced in the past. And that's why I'm so shocked is that there, there's sort of an over need an over request to get input from the community, which I think makes our, our board of trustees very special that we just don't act unilaterally. We want to hear a lot of voices. And this was one of those issues where, you know, at a minimum, would love to hear from the adjacent neighbors on what their concerns are and trying to address those concerns, um, you know, in, in a public forum. If, if I may recommend, because Mr. Leone, I spoke with him this evening, um, and he unfortunately he was unable to attend the village board meeting, um, but he did say that this was conceptual still at this point in time, um, that he's not even certain if he'll be able to get sufficient staffing to be able to do um, what his architect initially laid out on the plan. Um, if the board doesn't believe that um, this is in the interest of the community. I can reach out to him and tell him that um, we're not interested in evaluating at this time. Uh, so he was open to different feedback, whether or not it needed to be scaled back. But then he also said he understood if the board was not interested in having this. I don't think anyone has said the latter that not interested. I just think we need to get feedback and how do we uh, uh, you know, address the many concerns that are going to come into play. I mean, Labara has always done a great job, very respectful from its neighbors, but, you know, we do have, you know, three or four backyards that, you know, butt up right against that space. So it'd be nice to hear suggestions from those neighbors and then see, uh, you know, Pat and his group, you know, work collaboratively to come up with a solution. I'd love to see this personally, but, you know, I, I can imagine you know, having a public bocce court in my backyard and how that would, uh, um, you know, you know, bigger fence, bigger noise barrier or something, but just there's got to be a way to get everybody's input and find a common ground. Yeah, I think, you know, I can step in. I, I think everyone on the board agrees with everything you just said, Trustee Hannon. I mean, our primary concern is the well-being and, and peace of mind of our, of our, our neighbors. Uh, so we'll make sure that I, you know, I, I suspect the next step should be an actual kind of a site plan kind of concept where they, they I, mean, I think the burden of proof is gonna be on, on the business to show that this can be done in a way that is appropriate for our community. So uh, I, would, I would suggest that if folks have other comments or concerns that you send them directly to manager Francis and then she can work with Mr. Leone to see if this is something he wants to pursue. We done with that one? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we'll move on now to <clears throat> reports of departments, commissions, and trustee liaisons. Are there any liaison reports this evening? Hearing none, first up is an update on 43 East Quincy, Director Malchioti. Good evening, President Sells, Village Trustees, and Village Manager Francis. The building at 43 East Quincy has an interesting history, one we are proud to be associated with. 
The building was owned by the American Legion until 1968 when they sold it to the village and it was used to provide recreation programming to the community until 1988. In 2014, the department and village administration looked at the building as an opportunity to expand recreation, but the purchase price and necessary renovations made it unrealistic at that time. Five years later in 2019, the village board had another opportunity and based on the growing needs of the community and the success of the department, we were able to come full circle and provide recreation opportunities at this facility once again. It was a significant village asset in the past and will continue to be moving into the future. We are asking residents that participated in programs during that time to contact us and forward any photos that we could display in the lobby as a reminder of the connection between then and now. So much of what we do creates memories just like Memorial Hall in the past and we start creating new memories today. While the building required extensive renovation, we took great care in doing things right to make sure this facility was welcoming, accommodating, and most of all, safe for the public for years to come. Investing in this building and equipment now saves maintenance costs in the future. Those maintenance costs will also be reduced by the department moving out of other buildings, such as the garage behind Township Hall and the train station. <clears throat> we installed brand new HVAC systems, eliminated lead water lines, added fire suppression and alarm systems, and created spacious ADA restroom facilities to serve all that enter our building. We also maximized our resources by utilizing assets that remained after the building was purchased. The entire second floor office space was created with furniture that already existed within the structure. Large shelving units left in the garage area will be utilized for the majority of our storage with no additional cost to the project. An outdoor shelter that was included with the property will be utilized for vehicle parking and additional outdoor storage, increasing the life of our vehicles and maximizing storage options. We also completed as much demolition and renovation in-house as possible, and we were even able do to donate some equipment and supplies to benefit other departments within the village. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Finance Director Johns to give an overview of the financials of the project. Good evening. The original estimate for this project was $681,400, which included purchasing costs. During the construction process, many items were discovered to be in worse condition compared to the initial estimates provided, which were, previ which were previously brought to the board for approval. Most notably were the requirements of sprinklers, installation of a new water line to accommodate sprinklers and expanded ADA bathrooms, additional HVAC unit due to, um, due to an unforeseen replacement. Due to these additional costs, many efforts were done to explore the reduction in scope of the project, including eliminating offices and reusing existing furniture, eliminating demolition costs by working with the fire department, and using, utilizing staff for flooring work and delivery of items. The final cost of this project was $970,903. The Village of Riverside has paid for the acquisition and legal costs out of unassigned fund balance, while the improvements to the facility will be paid out of the park re Parks and Recreation assigned fund balance. This Parks and Recreation assigned fund balance will transfer $125,000 in 2020 and $25,000 annually for the next 25 years. These contribution balances are derived from user program fees and will be discussed in a later agenda item. The exponential growth of new residents and young families within Riverside has been developing in recent years as referenced in the Crane's Chicago Business article from November, 2020. Residents and realtors alike will tell you that families with young children are moving in rapidly and we need to address the needs of those families. This community center will allow us to do that by expanding our offerings and be able to accommodate a larger number of children within them. Enrollment within District 96 has increased significantly, necessitating additions and expansions at every elementary school. This growth illustrates the importance of this community center to Riverside and the programs we can offer due to it. We don't just want the public to visit and appreciate this building, we want them to utilize it. All of our programming will be to engage participants and have them actively incorporate 
this building into their lives. The benefits of this building and the department go way beyond additional programming. Parks and Recreation is a valuable investment in any community, providing a positive impact on property values, wellness, volunteerism, civic pride, social interaction, and inclusion. We are an important partner in the physical, emotional, and social development of children within the community, and it's a responsibility that we take very seriously by providing a safe and participatory environment. We are able to enhance all of those experiences and serve the entire community under this expansion by offering a wider range of programs from early childhood to active adult slash senior programs, in addition to spe special recreation with our partner WSSRA, we'll be able to meet the growing needs of Riverside at the high level they deserve. We are proud to be a part of an already robust business district, and we look forward to partnering with local businesses to provide collaborative programs. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Rental space for meetings and parties is not readily available within Riverside, but this facility will offer that opportunity to the community. This facility will be available for rental, avoiding the inconvenience of hosting yourself, including setup and cleanup. Host your party here in our large multi-purpose room and leave the party planning to us. We will have staff to set up the room according to your needs, make sure that you have everything you need, help you throughout the party, and best of all, clean up after you're done. We offer themed parties from pirate to princess and everything in between. And while we are excited about the programs and rentals we can provide inside the building, we are equally as excited about the opportunities that the parking lot will afford us. We will finally have dedicated parking for anyone visiting the building, whether you are participating or registering. We'll be hosting frequent pop-up community events throughout the year, independently and in cooperation with our neighbors in the business district. Food truck events will feature a different menu each visit and will not impact street traffic. Future events may include ice cream socials, family fun fairs, chalk art festivals, and utilizing the synthetic ice rink that was donated by a generous Riverside resident and could be set up to provide an ice skating experience at any time of the year. These are just some of the future events that we'll be rolling out while looking forward to having another attraction on Quincy Street for the annual holiday stroll. We will work closely with local businesses and also residents that are neighbor our building to make sure that our impact is low and our events are enjoyed by everyone. While we rely on input from residents in regard to program ideas and needs, we have many ready to go at the Quincy Community Center and the Water Tower. While the Water Tower will be the new hub for early childhood education and youth programming, it will still host some of your favorites. New programming that will be featured at Quincy Street Building will include adult canvas painting, youth DIY classes, no bake cooking classes, youth holiday cooking classes, learn magic, chess scholars, let's build it, Spanish amigos, stage stars, adult yoga, taekwondo for all ages, cardio kickboxing, step class, weight training, mini movers dance classes, kids game nights, improv for youth and adults, youth fitness classes, escape rooms, kitty drive-in movies, youth dance classes, themed party rentals with planning, Zumba, all forms of yoga for all ages, CPR class, babysitting classes, pajama spa nights, giving artfully, drawing class, Zumba gold, STEM classes, public speaking classes, drop-in senior bingo, adult art classes, and music and language programs. And I have already spoken with Quincy Street Distillery and the Riverside Arts Center regarding cooperative programming. We will have that and much more. The benefits of this community center are boundless and we plan to explore all of them. We will also be host posting a virtual facility tour on the village website in a few days, which was produced by Riverside TV until we can have a proper grand opening. Thank you. Thank you, Director Malchiotti and Director Johns. Are there any questions for either of the directors? Ms. Evans? Um, yes, so we do have a survey out. Um, right, Director Malchiotti, there's a survey for residents. Is that still open? 
it is still live. It is on our website page and also our Facebook and Instagram pages. Okay, good. Yeah, it's going to be really important to hear from the residents to find out, you know, what are, you gave quite a long list of um, what we're going to offer, but, you know, maybe there's something else out there that people might want. So we got to make sure that um, everyone gets a chance to fill that survey out. Mr. Gallagher, so I saw your hand, I think. Well, I did. I just had some comments because, um, well, I did have the opportunity of, of touring that building. I was very excited to see um, the new building completed for our residents to enjoy. Um, I did reach out to the American Legion to see what kind of historical photos they might have to add to the, uh, uh, I think I was wanted to do a display or something like that um, to show the heritage of that building. Um, I happen to have a, a baseball uniform from decades ago that the American Legion had, um, which I like to donate to the rec department to display on the wall. Um, it kind of ties in both the heritage of that, uh, of that building with the American Legion and recreation. <clears throat> and uh, I, I'm really excited about, about it. You know, there's a lot of good things happening. So this is just the beginning. That's all I have to say. Mr. Chisa. Yeah, Ron, just kudos to you and the, and the, the entire department about working through this and building this out. I, uh, I took gymnastics there and my illustrious gymnastics career ended very shortly, but I'll try and find some photos of myself <laughs> in, the group, in brown shorts and a brown t-shirt. On it behalf of the board, we'd all like to see career. that. What? <laughs> On behalf of the board, we'd all like to see those photos. <laughs> I was actually going to suggest that maybe they could be misplaced somehow. <laughs> Remember it. <laughs> Other comments or questions? Yeah. Mr. Han. If I, you know, the, the, I want to just sort of emphasize what a great asset this is for the community. Um, I know there's been, you know, some discussions on the cost overruns, but, you know, quite frankly, uh, you know, every extra thing that was done was done with, with safety in mind. Um, which I think is a great priority. And, you know, we need to focus that this is a, a new asset on Quincy Street, hopefully becomes an anchor for other businesses to come down. And just, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as the directors both mentioned, you know, this is a, a excellent place for the future of parks and rec activities and just the huge laundry list of offerings that they can now do in a great facility. So, you know, I look at this as a great step towards, uh, you know, number one, you know, getting more activity on Quincy Street, but number two, a great, great improvement for the Parks and Recs program. So can't, can't emphasize my excitement about this enough. Oh, yeah. Very well put, Mr. Hannon. I agree with everything that you just said. Anything else on this matter? Um, who is here on behalf of the farmer's market? Who's going to give that update? That that will be me, and it will be much more brief than my last presentation. Okay, um, because I, I I just noted that we do have uh, a public comment that needs to be read, but uh, why don't you go ahead and finish up with the farmers market, and then we'll ask uh, Village Clerk Haley to read that comment. Director. Okay. Um, this is just a reminder that uh, our farmer's market, uh, we will be holding that again this year, building on the success of last year. We, uh, there were several uh, local communities that actually reached out to us in regard to our farmer's market and the setup and the logistics of it, using it as a model. So I would like to thank staff and uh, most importantly, the farmer's market committee uh, for putting together a, a safe and uh, systematic market. We will be working with the committee and our health inspector to ensure the safe and welcoming market that we hosted last year based on the latest IDPH and Illinois Farmers Market Association guidelines. We will provide the same organization and safety as last year, but we are exploring ways to expand without compromising that safety. All of your favorite vendors will be returning along with a few exciting new ones. Um, we will be, uh, adhering strictly to the latest guidelines, but we will be ready to pivot quickly as those guidelines change. The location will still be at Centennial Park next to the historical water tower at 10 Pine Avenue, and the entrance will remain on Pine Avenue. 
The market will be on Wednesdays starting June 2nd through October 6th from 2.30 to 7 p.m. And we hope to see you there. Thank you, Director. Any questions about the farmer's market? Sure, sure sign of summer. It's always welcome when it returns. One quick question. What was the first date we are looking at for that? June 2nd will be the start. Okay. Okay, so we're going to go back now and Clerk Haley, would you like to read the uh, mm -hmm. received? I'm, I'm happy to do that. I do see that there are two Glorias in attendance at the meeting and the comment is from Gloria Lyman. So I would say if Gloria Lyman is one of the Glorias, would you like to comment now? If not, I will read the comment. Ms. Lyman, are you with us on the, this call? Apparently not. <laughs> okay, I will go ahead and read the comment then. Um, so this comment is regarding the Groveland Levy flood risk management project. And she says, I am a new resident here in the village of Riverside and I live on Groveland Avenue right before the bridge. I think any type of wall would be a detriment to nature here and an eyesore to this lovely area. When I chose to live here and particularly on Groveland Avenue itself, I decided to pick this neighborhood because I was looking for an area surrounded by nature with a small town atmosphere. My residence looks out across the berm so I get to enjoy the trees, river and scenic view as well as all of the various nature that this area provides a home uh, to in all seasons. Since I am an active walker in the area, I have gotten to know several of the wooded spots and discovered that the Audubon Society informed the village president that the Desplaines River corridor through Riverside has been designated an important bird area after a two year effort by local volunteers to identify more than 60 species of migratory birds in that area. The Riverside Displains River Corridor provides crucial migratory stopover habitat for an abundance of woodland bird species, um, said Stephanie Belk, the Illinois Important Bird Area Coordinator and Com Conservation Science Manager for Audubon Great Lakes. Um, she includes a link to the article in her email. Um, she says, this would be a disaster for all of the residents that have properties that have a view of the river and purchased their home with the intent of enjoying the beauty of the area, let alone destroying their backyards and property. Also, when life gets back to some type of normal, I'm sure the established businesses are hoping to recoup monies from lost income because of the pandemic. I would think putting up a horrendous structure like the wall would definitely uh, kill any type of tourism income that Riverside would hope to gain, as well as killing the wildlife from massive destruction of habitat and ecosystem. I have a background in marketing and I think this will destroy the charm of the area and any new upcoming business that would hope to set up shop in this area and gain customers that would visit this charming Mecca. So I vote no to any flood control wall. Thank you for allowing me to voice my opinion and concerns respectfully, Gloria Lyman. Thank you, Ms. Haley. Moving on now to ordinances and resolutions. First up is an ordinance amending various sections of chapter five relating to parades, uh, title six, police regulations of the village code of the village of Riverside, manager Francis. Certainly, um, and attorney Molino can chime in after I give the very quick summary. As the board may recall, in July of last year, the village board discussed this chapter of the village code as it related to information on parades, protests, processions, etc. At that meeting, the board directed the village attorney to draft an ordinance to remove dated information. Attached are the changes, and I'm certain Attorney Molina can walk the village board through those modifications that were made to make them, uh, to update them consistent with uh, what is currently statutorily required. So basically what we did is we got rid of the, the old ordinance had the time periods for approval were much too long. Uh, this, there were no objective standards. It was basically discretionary and those things because they uh, affect freedom of speech uh, have been held by the courts over the last years to be uh, unconstitutional. 
the new ordinance meets the current requirements for requiring a permit. So there is uh, notification so that public safety can be guarded for larger groups, including parades, protests, whatever it may be, but meet the reasonable standards that are required. I would ask for a motion to approve an ordinance amending various sections of Chapter 5, Title 6 of the Village Code of the Village of Riverside. Make a motion. Motion by Ms. Evans, second by Mr. G. Second. Questions or comments? Please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Giza. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion passes. Next up is an ordinance providing for the registration and inspection of rental properties within the building of the Riverside. Ms. Francis, I believe this is yours too. Yes, I will be presenting as well as uh, finance director Johns will be providing the input as it relates to the financial piece. So the village board discussed this at the last meeting to provide some feedback as it relates to rental and registration process for both multifamily and single family homes. The, at that meeting, um, the board discussed different types of options that could potentially occur, whether or not we do inspections. Um, once there is a vacancy, the triennial inspection, or also um, once a unit becomes vacant and whether or not we would waive a subsequent inspection based on the timing of the previous inspection. There would be an annual registration requirement um, to update any dated information. This would be for the property owner, not for the renters. Um, and so based on the feedback from the board at the last meeting, um, there were questions related to fees from our contractor for these particular uh, rental inspections that we would do on a triennial or whatever type of basis the board elects. Um, and also the cost of single family and um, the cost of additional staff time to do these processes in house. So Director Johns has run certain calculations based on the estimates of the rental buildings um, and approximately how much it will cost to manage it with the, within our financial software. I'll turn it over to her to provide the different scenarios that were outlined, whether we're assessing an annual registration fee or if all of that is captured just within the triennial inspection. So, Director Jones. And I, may I, may I step in here just a second, Manager Francis? Certainly. Um, because the reason I'm, I'm doing this is to see if this, if this part of the report is necessary. Um, I, you know, I, I have concerns about the um, kind of the onerous nature of this with regard to the, the vacancy inspections. We did receive, the board received today a letter from one of our uh, property man managers who made some, I thought some really excellent points about the the impact, the cost impact that this as drafted would have on, on our, our multifamily property owners. Uh, he had a, what I thought was a, a better idea than the one that is currently in, in, in this, this draft. His suggestion was to just, to make it very simple, we would have a triennial inspection as contemplated by part of this ordinance. But then instead of having the vacancy inspections, we would simply have a percentage of rental units in a given building subject to random inspections, which would take the ongoing burden off of our staff and the ongoing burden off of the property managers with regard to turnovers. He pointed out very compellingly, I thought, the kind of the modern nature of, of the rental world and how sometimes these, these apartments are being re-rented re before they're even vacant. And the hardship on the property owners should, um, should there be some kind of lag time in the, in the village being able to get over and do the inspections. So the reason I bring this up, uh, Manager Francis, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but if, if there's a, if I think that it would, 
behoove us to let the trustees weigh in on this and let's talk about what kind of inspections are we actually looking for? Um, and then, you know, Director Johns could provide kind of the financial aspect of that at, at a future board meeting. Another, another question that I have as well, and I think we can find this out if we take a little bit more time with, with this ordinance, is, uh, is whether, and I know that Trustee Pollock had, had concerns about this last time, kind of on the opposite side of what I'm getting ready to say, is whether or not this is something that, that we do want to charge our property owners for these kind of inspections, since it is uh, a matter of public safety and health. So you know, I, I apologize in kind of for interrupting this, but I'd, I'd really like to hear a more general discussion of, of this ordinance and where trustees, where do you think we are in this process uh, before we ask Director Johns to do any kind of analysis. So I'll turn it over to you, Director um, Ms. Haley. We do have someone, uh, Kay Johnson with a hand raised. I'm not sure if they're interested, that person is interested in commenting on this topic. Ms. Johnson, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? I can. Uh, oh. did, you want, did you want to did you want to comment on this item? Yeah, I'm sorry. I and I wasn't sure what the protocol was because I missed the beginning because I got one of those nice long trains that stopped on the tracks <laughs> on my way home. So um, I'd That's like to comment. Thinking. Yeah, go go right ahead, Ms. Johnson, please. Okay. So, and I'm glad you actually brought that up because that's uh, some of what I was talking about. I think there's a, um, an under, it's been underestimated the logistical issues of having those inspections for every change of tenant and they're happening at the same time, the same few days at the end in the beginning of each month. We actually have a uh, unit on Groveland. So if I get the chance, I'd like to see if I can comment, make a short comment on the, the berm. But um, I, I think that's underestimated the logistical issues on both ends, as far as the village and the property owner. Um, I mean, there's no question that there are a few bad actors who have known history of taking advantage of their, their tenants with little consequence um, and absolutely uh, need to have a system. And I think that it's reasonable to have a registration, but not to overburden either of these uh, systems. And I think if you look at something such as having um, your initial uh, registration and th those triennial inspections, um, and what I was going to say was also the idea of random um, random inspections, but maybe having either self-certifying um, when there's a change or annually between um, and possibly even requiring, um, well, having something where once they're registered, there is um, mail or notification going out so that tenants are aware of um, kind of like a, a tenant's rights and how to contact the village type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I wanted to put out there. Okay. Oh, you're I muted. Yeah, I'm, back. I'm back, I'm back. I'm back. Um, so you said you'd like to say something about the berm, so feel, feel free, please go ahead. Okay, so the berm, I've had this uh, pretty much on, ongoing. Uh, so the berm has never failed. And the engineers need to realize that the, the nature that's there, the structure, the biological, um, you know, you've got those tree roots in there that are holding things together. You get the other foliage that's holding things together. Um, I know that their big thing, they say, well, we don't know what it's like under the surface, but it hasn't failed. Um, and it would absolutely be a shame to just wipe that clean like nothing. And it, it is. And I, I agree with 
with some of this, the statements that were, were read, but that's not the only concern. I think that the engineers are stuck on the idea of the 100-year flood, even though they agree that it doesn't have to be a 100-year flood. They could calculate something, you know, if it's an 89-year flood that actually has the same protection. You don't have to round up just because we happen to be on a base 10 uh, counting system. And that's that's why they use the 100, not because it's that much better, but that's because we think we round things, right? Um, and I, I think that would really be a, a terrible loss generally to just get rid of all those trees and get rid of that character and to, you know, make, you turn it into a, a cookie cutter uh, thing. And I, I think that they need to kind of get out of their, their habits of how they address things mechanically and understand that there, there are other ways to do it. Um, so that's, that's uh, all I'll say for now. <laughs> okay. All right, so since we're on this, we're, we're not on the berm uh, to talk about it right now. So we're, let's stick with this. So trustees, with regard to the, the ordinances in front of you, um, are, do you have any other suggestions that you would like our staff to look into to bring back something that would be more feasible and in terms of logistics, as Ms. Johnson said, on both ends, both with regard to the village and with regard to our property owners? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I, I also appreciated Mr. Weaver's feedback and um, agree that perhaps we should reconsider the inspection requirement every time a tenant leaves throughout the year. Um, I did wonder about sustainability for that for staff and, um, you know, I, I applaud you, applaud you um, Manager Francis, for making the commitment, but um, I do think it's going to be tough for staff, and it seems like also the requirement would place an undue burden on landlords, which we don't want. Um, and yes, we could. I liked his idea of randomly sampling apartments um, instead throughout the year. And I also liked his recommendation of writing um, in the authority to inspect any property more fully in the event of a pattern of serious violations. Um, and I did have a question. Do we, do we inspect the storefronts uh, prior to issuing annual business licenses? It also seemed like a good idea. So we do do an annual fire inspection um, where usually the building inspector will go in with the fire inspector to go into the different retail uh, establishments or restaurants. Um, and then also they have their um, health inspections twice a year. Ms. Collins? I also have a concern, just the cost to the landlords. I know that $25 an inspection doesn't seem like that much, but depending on how many units you have, that could be a substantial amount of money. And I think that it does become an issue of do we need to cover our costs on this or is it something that the village is willing to cover, especially if we could take care of some of these issues, maybe we could reduce our legal fees or there may be some other um, opportunities for savings if, if some of these rental issues were taken care of. So I think that's a decision that the board needs to make philosophically. Is this something that needs to cover costs or not? I was also thinking that um, we might have different requirements for buildings with more than five units or 10 units or something like that, like maybe um, ease the restrictions or the requirements for the small three, three unit buildings. Um, and also are the fees, the fees would only be imposed once every three years, right? Because it would be a cyclical review cycle, inspection cycle. If we didn't look at the apartments every time somebody moved out. 
That's so it, go ahead, Jess. Sorry. No, that's okay. It, it depends on which scenario the board goes to, um, whether it's we only bill them on a triennial or are we billing them for the triennial inspection, but having an annual registration fee to cover our direct costs? <clears throat> Sorry, not to. So th there's, there's essentially two different options, or if the board elects to not charge anything to do that complete waiver period, or waiver essentially of the inspections and absorb that um, through other fees and taxes, this program. So I guess there's three different scenarios now that we're talking about. So along that line, I don't know if this is for you, Manager or Director Johns. I see in the memo that the there's a two thousand dollar estimated cost for the annual registration forms. If we were charged for those, I don't see a cost for the actual. If we just did the triennial inspection, what would be the cost to the village for that? So on the I'm sorry, on the second page um, in my little table with that's green and blue, mm -hmm. um, there's an option of the annual registration cost being um, $10 annually or rolling it in to the um, triennial fee when it would be, that would be represent 15 because that would be for every unit instead of every building. No, that's that's not my question, Director. I, oh, I'm asking what would be what's the cost to the village to conduct the inspections? The inspection cost is forty dollars for apartment and a hundred dollars for a single family home. And the cost of processing those inspections with scheduling and billing for those is fifteen dollars per inspection. Oh, I see here now. Okay. And is the concept that on the triennial, we would inspect apartments or would we be inspecting common areas and just a random selection of apartments? We wouldn't be so like we wouldn't be in going into every single apartment, right? Over a three year period um, is how it was envisioned would be that we would touch every rental property within the village over three years. The common areas are inspected by the fire department on an annual basis as well for the multifamily, not for single family homes though. So. so am I, tell me if I'm getting this right and hope I'm not muddling things. If we're looking at $50 to inspect a unit and we have 1500 units that we're going to inspect over a three-year period, that's 25 grand for a three-year period. Is that is that right? That would be our cost to the village. So about 8,000 some and change per year for this project. And I'm just looking at the, I'm not looking at houses right now. I'm just looking at the rental units. Did you say 1,500 units? But you said in the memo that there are 1,500 people living in rental units. So it would be 75,000 total for the program, 25,000 for the year, so. I'm sorry, it's approximately 750 rental units. And if I assume there's two people per unit, there would be 1,500 people living in rental units. So there's 750 units. Approximately. So that's 37.5 over a three year period. Which is 12.5. 12.5 annually. So I guess the question, going back to the Trustee Collins point, Mr. Pollock, I know you had brought this up before on the other kind of the other side of this is you know, if you figure in the, the is it worth charging our, our property owners? Or something like this, when, or is this uh, is this something that we think that the that the village should absorb? Mr. Chisa, do you want to address that? Uh, Ed, do you want to go first? I'm, I, we we raised at the same time. I'm no, okay. go go ahead, okay. Trustee. Yeah, I, I I think that the landlords should be charged for this. 
Um, I mean, this can be part of the application process. They can pass it through to the tenants themselves. I just applied. I'm, I'm going to be renting a home in Riverside for the next year. And I just paid a $25 application fee that was charged me by the landlord um, to, to do a credit check. I, I would say it would be, I would not be in support of passing this through to the village. This is something that the landlord should pay for its business and they can either pay for it themselves or they can build it into the application fee or bake, bake the 10 bucks or 50 bucks, whatever it is into the annual rent, which comes to 75 cents a month. Mr. Hannon. Uh, you know, I, I, I agree with trustee Jesus, but you know, one concern I have, and I think this goes to the fee issue. If, if we are moving to a three year cycle, um, you know, my concern would be uh, if we're in a situation where we're unable to get into the unit uh, in a timely manner. And so there, you know, I, I think, and, and I'll defer to attorney Molina on what's involved, you know, what is the um, late fee for lack of a better word, if, if somebody, if you can't get in until you're four or it's, you know, you're five and you haven't been in yet, um, you know, there needs to be something built in there. And maybe that's another way to address this fee issue that, you know, if, if you're in a timely manner, it's, it's X. Um, but if you, if you're not timely, you know, it's three times X, whatever, you know, we think is, is defensible and that gets put in the pool to cover the costs. Well, those, if someone is not responsible in cooperating to get the inspection done, that's a violation of the ordinance. And so they could be brought up for violating the ordinance and fined. And we could segregate those fines and include them in the program instead of what, you know, generally how we account for them now if they were, if they relate to the rental system. But to not allow reasonable access that's required under the inspection program is itself a violation of the code or would be if this were passed. Mr. Paul. Uh, thank you, President Zell. So as far as the fees are concerned, I agree with Trustee Gisa. I mean, this is a, whatever it costs the village to provide this service to the residents, and this is a service to the residents, uh, whatever it costs the village to do that, the landlords should cover that. You know, if they, you know, eventually transfer that cost to their tenants, that's up to them. But I do feel strongly that whatever the cost is, and I think that cost is minimal, whatever that cost is, um, should be paid for by the landlords. Um, you know, I think for me, the main the main issue is I, I don't really care about the details so much, but whatever it takes to at least once every three years inspect the HVAC systems, the plumbing, uh, the life safety issues and all that, at least once every three years, whatever works, that's fine with me. But uh, we need to be doing that at least once every three years. Every three years is probably the right, right amount of time. And uh, and then, you know, as I said, passing that cost along to the landlords um, within that parameter, I, I don't really have strong feelings on how we do do the rest. So am I am I right that there, there seems to be a consensus and correct me if I'm wrong, that that we are interested in doing the triennial triennial inspections having some percentage and our attorneys can determine what the proper percentage would be for random inspections and that the, and that the cost, the basically the overhead for this program would be uh, passed along in terms of fees to the, the property owners. Is that correct? Is yes. everyone shaking their head? Yeah. Collins, what do you think about that? So is there a three-year inspection? And in addition, there's a possible another inspection during that three-year period? And is the landlord paying for both of those? Is that what we're saying? That's the concept, as I understand it. There, there, you know, there would be some percentage, 5% or whatever, that would be subject to random inspections. Now, of course, you could, you know, if, the, if the board wishes, you could just charge for the triennial 
inspections and then absorb the cost of the random inspections. That's that's a detail that's up to, to you, the six of you. Yeah, I just start, I just think it's, I think that every three years is adequate. I don't, I would prefer to see um, other inspections only for cause or for there's been a complaint or something like that, that we have the opportunity to inspect at that time. But if we're doing it every three years, why do we need to do a random in addition to that? Mr. Malay, that's a, that's a good point there. Um, under, let's assume our, our, the, where we are right now before this ordinance comes along. Um, what kind of authority does the village have to do an inspection? Let's say, you know, a resident calls up in, from a unit and says, yeah, I think there's a problem in unit, you know, 2C or something. Do we have any authority that would allow us to go in and inspect on a complaint like that? Yes. I mean, the, if it, the someone who leases property has the right to, invi to invite people and that those people can include inspectors. And so if a resident calls with a complaint, we have the authority as long as the lessee invites us in to inspect. It's no violation of the landlord's rights. That really wasn't my, my concept. Let's, let's oh. say that, if, uh, I mean, obviously somebody can ask us to come and look in their own apartment, but what if, <laughs> what if we get a complaint, you know, a, a resident calls and says, you know, I don't think the, the, the boiler is working properly. Do, is that grounds for us to go in and, and to inspect under our current law? No, I mean, we, it depends on where the boiler is, I guess. Uh, the, we have the right, just as general public does, to go on to the common areas. Uh, units themselves are, are private. Um, so if we got an, if we received a complaint, I would think we would call the landlord in order to do an inspection on the boiler. If the landlord said no, I mean, that would be a violation of the ordinance. Could we walk right through if the landlord objected to us going into a private area that's not open to a common area? Probably not, just based on a resident complaint. So let me ask uh, trustees for you to weigh in on what Trustee Collins just said. Are you, would you prefer just to have the triennial? Or do you like the idea of a triennial with also some percentage of random inspections being possible? What are your thoughts on that? I like random inspections. I think that our ordinance needs to have some teeth, a little bit more bigger teeth than just, you know, every three years we might come and check out the building. So that's doesn't seem I don't know, it doesn't seem to have that strength behind it. Mr. Pollock? Well, if if we can pass an ordinance that allows us to do random inspections, why can't we also uh, do those same inspections on a complaint basis? I mean, it seems to me if we're doing it scheduled inspections, you have to be inspected everything in the building, all infrastructure in the building has to be inspected once every three years um, for life safety issues, et cetera. Um, and in between that, we can either do random or complaint-based. Can't we do both or, or just complaint-based in the interim? Mr. Molina? So we can do the requirement. I think maybe we're, we're talking different things. So we can, we can do both or one or the other, but they remain requirements. There is gonna be an issue when we don't have cooperation. And that's what I was getting at. So even with the triennial, triennial, triennial inspections, you may have, or sometimes it can be a tenant. The tenant can be an obstacle saying, I don't wanna allow anybody in my apartment. And we can't just use our ordinance to say, well, we're walking in anyway. Um, we need to deal with that through the violation system. Ultimately, we might need to get a court, an administrative warrant to, for, to get the authority to break in if we need to, but, but we can't just give ourselves the right to go into private areas if we don't have consent. 
Now, the landlord's, the landlord's situation is by requiring registration, by filling that form out, you know, we're saying that they're, they're going to cooperate. So if they don't, we can charge them administratively and find them initially. Usually we'll get cooperation, though, because it's part of doing business in the village. But so I was talking about more of the idea, if we get a complaint, could we just walk into a a boiler area. Well, if the boiler area were part of the common area, yes, it might not be, but ultimately this could happen in a variety of contexts once the system is in place. I hope I clarified what I was trying to do. Mr. Gallagher. I did have a question about thinking. So let me give you a scenario, council, if, if you would. So let's say that uh, a tenant complains to the village and says, my ceiling is leaking and it's been leaking for, for a long period of time they can give us the right to go into their unit to inspect it. Is that, is that accurate? Yes. That is correct. Even but if the landlord doesn't want us there. Okay. Yes. But if the tenant above says, no, too bad you're not coming into my unit to see if I'm leaking my pipes, what happens in that scenario? Well, so we would initially, if the tenant won't let us in, we call the landlord and say, look, you have damage occurring in your building and a tenant is refusing to let us in. Please help us. We need to get in there. It's an issue. If the landlord landlord should try to help resolve the problem, both for, for that landlord's own sake, because there's damage to the infrastructure, it, you would certainly tell the tenant, you have to let the village in, you need to let my plumber in, or you're in violation of the of the lease. Uh, but but there again, ultimately, if we get into an extreme case, let's say someone with, with mental health issues where they have a hoarding problem and they are they are just freaking out, not wanting anyone in, we might need to get a court order to get us in. And I've had that happen. But that's a separate issue from the kind of requirements we're talking about imposing. I understand how can it's right in general. So that's clarify things for, for me as well. Okay. Okay. So other comments uh, on this question of whether just to have a triennial or triennial plus uh, some percentage of random. Need to hear from everybody on this, please. I would be in favor of triennial requirements and fees and the random ones, I would not burn the, the building owner on those for fees. And I still want the ability to have those done, but we don't have to charge for that. That's just a matter of public safety in general. Other thoughts? Mr. Well, uh, oh, go ahead, Wendell. I was still thinking. Okay. Go ahead. Doug? Well, I was just going to say, I, I, I think I'm in agreement with Trustee Gallegos. Um, you know, the formal program should be yeah, once every three years. But I want to, I guess I would ask our legal counsel to write the ordinance in a way that maximizes our ability to go in with proper notice to tenants and landlords to go in on a random or complaint basis or whatever. I realize that, um, we still may end up going to court if we have an obstinate tenant or landlord, but I would want the ordinance written in a way that maximizes our ability to respond to a complaint between those three year uh, scheduled inspections. Right, it, it would be, uh, it would be Trustee Pollock, you know, it would say that there's an obligation based on a complaint that the village be allowed to inspect immediately you know, upon reasonable notice to the landlord. And if it's not in a private apartment area, then you know, the landlord would be obligated to let us in there. And if the landlord did, would be an immediate violation. I mean, it, it's going to be very rare, uh, but uh, theoretically it could happen. So I just wanted to make sure, I hope I didn't get us all on a tangent by getting into this area, but I wanted to make sure there was no confusion when the question was asked, well, if we get a complaint, can we go look? Well, yes, we can, we, we can give the obligation to let us look and we will, and it'll be as strongly worded as, as it can be. Um, but it doesn't solve, it doesn't give us carte blanche to ignore a refusal to cooperate in a, in a literal physical sense. 
but it remains a violation and obviously, you know, could be a serious one. It's public safety. And, and, and I, would, I would agree with Trustee Gallegos as well that our fee structure uh, should, should not consider those in between inspections. It should just be based on the scheduled every three year inspection and the, and the cost of running that program. So Mr. Hannon and Mr. G, so we need to hear your thoughts. I'll go first. I, I like the track that Trustee Pollock is on. Um, uh, you know, my initial thought is the rolling three-year cycle um, is sufficient, but to the extent we don't have the ability to, um, you know, a, a address a um, call in from a tenant, um, you know, I, I think we'll leave it to the attorneys to draft that so you know we can we can address the situation that trustee Gallegos and trustee Pollock had talked about i agree okay so it sounds like we're all on the same page here so we'll have the triennial and then we'll have language added that uh, allows for random and and or complaint driven inspections we will pass along the cost of the inspections for the triennial inspections, but we will not charge for, we will not charge the property owners for the in-between in between inspections. Have I got that right? Okay. So- okay, And then as to the percentage, you'll leave that drafting to us based on what's common in the industry. Okay. Yes, sir, exactly right. Okay, so um, Ms. Ms. Francis. Director Johns had um, her hand up. Both of you did. Director Johns, you want to go first? Thank you. Um, for the random inspections that are not going to be charged, if they require a re-inspection, would you like fees associated with that? I suspect the answer to that is no. Am I right, trustees? Yes. What's the purpose of the re-inspection? Yes. If they fail their first inspection, if they fail the random inspection. I say yes to fees. So yes, so we, you want to charge them for the re-inspection? Yeah. Ms. Francis? Are we also charging them for the annual registration or no? Well, that's something that's not in there now, but it was suggested, at least I believe, on uh, uh, Director Johns' analysis, right? Correct. Francis, okay. I would say yes to that. It's $10, right? It would be $10 per unit, or I'm sorry, per building. Um, my thought process in this was it would be, our software system is designed to have a fee associated with these permits or registrations. And then if they don't comply, it would give us the ability to have late fees. Do we plus, have if they, plus if they don't comply, it's a violation of the ordinance and they could be brought up that way as well. Do we know how many rental buildings there are? One hundred and seventy-five, approximately. So, seventeen fifty a year for registration fee, and I, I don't personally, and I'm not sure I I heard you, direct, director, correctly, if. If, we're, if you're saying that we're gonna charge this fee because our software wants it, that's not a reason. Um, I mean, we, if, you know, if there's a cost to us to administer this program and that $10 is intended to cover our, our cost, that's, that's a different thing, but I don't think we're gonna charge anybody anything because of a software program. Mr. Hannon? Yeah, I, I, I didn't hear her that way. I, I mean, I think the reinspection fee, I think it was Trustee Evans that said she was in favor of charging the reinspection fee. 
Um, I am as well. Uh, so I don't know if there's any other consensus on that reinspection fee, but I, I think, you know, Director Johns was that, you know, the fee, the fee charging was already built into the system. So we wouldn't have to do anything special if we did elect to charge a fee for the reinspection. Okay, I think we're talking two different things though. So the, the reins, I think there is consensus on the reinspection fee. The other question though is, are we gonna charge an annual registration fee of $10 per building? And, and to be clear, that cost is processing of mailing out the forms, receiving the forms, updating data, postage, so those are, are based on the calculations that Director Johns ran. Those are our direct costs associated with that. Okay. So are we all on the same page here then? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So Mr. Molina, do you have what you need to redraft and bring us something back? Next yes, week? I believe so, President okay. Sells. Okay. All right, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll leave this one then until our next meeting. Next up is our last one is an ordinance approving and authorizing repayment of the village's general fund from the parks and recreation assigned fund balance for certain costs related to 43 East Quincy. Director Johns, I believe this one's yours. Yes, thank you. As we spoke earlier about the construction in for 43 East Quincy, um, the amount that was designed to come out of unassigned fund balance was $248,376. That's the property costs and the legal associated with that, the property purchase. The, um, in previous discussions, the board wanted the parks and rec fund balance assignment to pay for the improvements to the facility, which came out to be 722,000. 527,000. We estimated a 25 year repayment schedule with 125,000 being paid in 2020. So I'd ask for a motion a second to approve an ordinance providing for the Parks and Recreation assignment repayment of the general fund for the remodel of 43 East Quincy. I'll make that motion. Motion by Mr. Gallagos, second by Second. By Mr. Pollock, comments or questions? Please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Gallagos. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Giza. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries. We have no uh, considerations. Is there any new business this evening? Hearing none, we do have a reason for an executive session to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the public body. So with that, I would ask for a motion to adjourn to executive session. But first I have to ask Mr. Molina, <laughs> <laughs> I remembered this time to uh, close this out with the COVID issue. Yeah, so under the Open Meetings Act amendments, uh, there needs to be a, an, an ascertainment that each of the elected officials that participated virtually due to the uh, specialized nature of the, of the virtual meetings, uh, that the record needs to demonstrate that they were able to hear everything sufficiently and were able to participate fully. So with those two admonitions in mind, I'll go around and ask e each of you, but uh, I'll just ask for an affirmative response that you were able to hear everything and participate fully in today's meeting thus far. Uh, Trustee Gallegos. Yes, to both. Trustee Evans. What? <laughs> <laughs> All yes. right, the yes, humor yes. starts. Uh, <laughs> Trustee Pollock. Yes. And uh, I'm, uh, Trustee Gisa. Yes. Trustee Collins. Yes. Uh, President Sells. I heard everybody except Trustee Evans for some reason. <laughs> and yes. I think I got everybody, but the, the cascade isn't there. Did I hit everybody? I, I think you missed me, but oh, I'm able to hear you loud and clear. Trusty, Trusty Hannon, thank you. As to both, you heard and participated. Yes. Great, thank All you. Of it. Okay, so now we can, uh, if we have the motion to go into closed, we can vote. I don't think we got there, right? We need it. Uh, we need a motion first. 
motion to adjourn to executive session. Mr. Gallagher, second by. Second. For, for personnel evaluation of performance. Is the yes. basis. So, second by Mr. Pollock. Please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Gallagos. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Giza. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Thank you, and thank you for all of our residents who joined us this evening. It's always nice when we have input from our from our neighbors. We appreciate it. Uh, with that, thank you. The meeting is adjourned. Good night.